Hi everyone, welcome to Type Talks. Today we have Vanessa with us, and she is the author of the article, A Guide to the ESTP Universe, which I'll link below. And so Vanessa, I'm wondering if you can tell us a little bit about yourself. Well, I am a clinical social worker by trade. Um, I got my master's at University of Chicago. And um, me and my husband, Kyle Jankowski, co-founded the Center for Change and Healing some 12 years ago. And this last year, we launched a pediatric division called uh, Birch Forest, even though it's under the same umbrella. But um, And uh, we really work to bring our, well, me especially, I work to bring the physical and experiential into the more of the clinical world. So I see that as being something that especially as an ESTP that I really love doing. Um, and our pediatric center is like has two gyms and art and play rooms so that um, those type of things, we continue to find different ways of bringing those in together. Um, so besides doing that and then working with people and clinically, I'm working on my dissertation for my doctorate in uh, depth psychology at Pacifica University. And um, that's taken up a lot of time. <laughs> so one of the things when, I, when I'm not doing all the academic work, either tied to a chair or a computer, um, I like rock climbing. Uh, I just got in from ballet dance that I also work to do and playing violin on, and I'm an artist. So those are some of probably like the major things I'm doing right now in my life. Um, I like staying very busy. <laughs> so that's always been a case. People will say, oh, you do a lot of things. And, um, but I, uh, it, I really do what I enjoy. And uh, it's a way of really staying vibrant and engaged with life. And um, I'm also an avid environmentalist. So um, always have some uh, rods in the fire for that. So uh, my husband and I bought a, a place that has a small forest grove on it. And so we also work to do reforestation there and then also work in the forest preserves and around our home to continue to work to make the environment healthy as well. So, yeah. When you get your PhD in death psychology, you know, you're very serious about Jungian typology. So it seems like you're doing a lot of things, Vanessa. And I notice a trend with extroverts. Jung says that they direct their libido to the external world. And so that's a fancy way of saying that they like to direct their energy to the outside world. And so you'll see a lot of extroverts just engaging with the world a lot, interacting with the world a lot. And so I'd love to talk about the article you wrote. And a part of it focuses on individuation. So I was wondering if you could go into the key points that stuck out the most to you when you wrote the article. And if you could illuminate the viewers on your mind and its workings. Yeah. Well, I originally had written... Um some of that article for Carol Shoemate's class in typology um, for that I was taking as part of my PhD program. And so it was a really neat opportunity to look back over my life through the lens of typology. And um, the individuation process really became very clear about um, many different facets. Uh, the main point that was kind of the focus of the article was really how do you get an extroverted sensing type who is very engaged in that external world, in activities and doing things, um, likes, I, at least I know, I really appreciate more uh, practical application. So when I first did my master's to get my clinical social work license, um, I had gone straight through with school from like kindergarten all the way through my master's. And I was partly picked clinical social work because you had two years of applied internship where you were actually doing the work along with um, working to uh, learn the theory. And I was definitely burned out on theory and I definitely would not have been doing my PhD back then. Um, so understanding like the, the drive of having to have something be practical. Um, when I would hear things about psychology or even typology um, and getting into the inner world and symbols with that union work, um, that um, 
they're like, oh, well, extroverted sensing types or ESTPs don't typically end up in the Jungian world. And I was like, well, that's because they're not taught how to understand it practically. And I'd had a mentor in uh, high school who had done a leadership training program, who was a clinical social worker and also a Jungian who had brought like really developed it for the usefulness of teenagers. And so I got into it and it just lit me up. And so when I would hear things later on in the field that um, it's not very practical for ESTPs or, you know, they don't they don't engage with it. I'm like, well, maybe it's about how it's taught. And so the article really was working to focus on how can you teach the practical application? And once that happens, there can be excitement about uh, the skill development through symbolic understanding. But the key is first helping um, get into the inner world when you're so outer focused. And one of the key things that I've done with leading um, a numerous retreats and co-leading them and having been on them before that was understanding the symbolic nature of synchronicities in the world around you. And um, that really kind of demanded the engagement of the introverted intuition in my inferior function. Um, and I realized that throughout my life that had been like the sweet spot is really finding the uh, transcendent uh, component of the dominant and inferior functions of the extroverted sensing with the introverted intuition. So seeing the symbolic nature of trees or what your eyes might get drawn to is actually about uh, cueing you into um, what you psychologically may need at that point or physiologically even need. And um, so that's what I really work to focus on in the article is having the explanation of both what it's like to be a young ESTP. Um, there is a, a component, both my parents are United Method, were United Methodist pastors. And I um, was in the church a lot, obviously. And one of the big differences between let's say Catholicism and Protestantism, especially United Methodists, is they took away a lot of the symbols on purpose. They were working to demystify the religion. But what physically happens is that there's not much interesting things to look at. And everything is rounded corners and honey oak and um, middle, middle colors. And, um, and I was bored out of my mind. And that made me think that spirituality was in essence boring, but that, that really wasn't the case. It just needed to be taught differently. Um, my father actually led, um, uh, 50 mile, uh, canoe trips that every other year down in the Merrimack Ozarks. And he, uh, would work to integrate certain Christian theology into that. So every morning you do a meditation where you would sit and watch like the world around you and then see what it evoked in you. And really in that particular lens, looking at how the divine was present, right. Or how God was present. And, um, that probably would have been a much better way of, of teaching spirituality when I was younger. Right. Um, but, uh, I got big into horse training, um, and horse riding and, uh, problem solving. I mean, so that, that took a numinosity to me of like, um, if there's a problem that there's gotta be a means to solve it. And that was really bringing in and engaging that TI in a whole different way. Um, and the, in the extroverted world. So my parents didn't have enough money for me to like take more horse lessons. So I figured there's got to be a way. And so I looked all around and the barn and I was like, well, there's horses who just stand around. I was about 10 and like someone's got to let me ride one of them. And so I asked around and somebody did, but I needed to come up with half of the board and um, about 400 bucks a month. And I was like, well, my parents don't have money for more lessons. And I'm going to have to figure it out. I'm like, well, I need a job. So I went to the barn manager and uh, I said, uh, Steve, I need a job. And he laughed at me and uh, my feelings are hurt. And I turned, walked back into the tax stall and cried. I dried my eyes, composed myself. 
I walked back out and I said, Steve, I need a job and I can do it. And he took me serious and he let me practice uh, doing the chores and then hired me. And so began my living at the barn and riding and training horses, uh, which I eventually switched to becoming a live-in student and going pro. And what I understood looking back at that extroverted sensing lens is, is that there is a certain, people will call it a fearlessness that will occur with, a, with especially the extroverted sensing types. And it wasn't a fearlessness because there, well, I mean, there's an absence of fear, but it's a more of like, well, it'll work out. <laughs> and that's something uh, that uh, Kevin, my brother, who's married to an extroverted sensing type, and Kyle will always comment is uh, I'm like, no, no, it'll work out. They're like, yeah, will it? Or is that just an extroverted sensing type? I'm like, it does, right? So there's a certain um, that like going for it component that I found was super uh extroverted sensing gear just that was ex super exaggerated when I was younger. Um, and then that introverted thinking coming in to figure out the problem. There's got to be a way of solving this problem. And uh, my mom used to say no was the beginning of a negotiation. So, um, and then the extroverted feeling was always there, always working to like come in. It was a youngster it was over people pleasing you know, would uh, be something I would always have to work with. And I've, you know, worked to balance that out more. And then, like I said, in meeting uh, my mentor and really learning about the psyche, it really brought in that introverted intuition. And by the time I was having to decide if I was really going to be a professional horse trainer or artist, I had kind of burned out some of that extroverted sensing. Like I knew because in bringing in the intuition in these other areas, that that numinosity around doing all the physical things, uh, I hiked a lot of mountains, I did a lot of rock climbing, um, wasn't going to be long lasting. Like I could just sense that. And I needed to find a profession that could engage both. So then when I went off to college, um, I, I really continued that exploration to do that. And so in the article, I kind of go through some of those processes. Um, also, part of the thing I was focused on in the article was that there was a particular exercise that was just pure introverted intuition. And it was working with a dream image on the retreat. And this, the hopeless futility that arose around ever being able to do it. Um, extroverted sensing. It's very fast. Wants it very quickly. Um, it's like, well, if I'm not good at it, I move on. Right. Um, but instead, uh, this wasn't something that I could just move on from. So I, you know, um, stuck with it, um, by climbing up in a tree actually, because the image I was working with was a hawk. So I was like, well, let's try to engage the extroverted sensing world to help this. And Finally, there was, um, so no, there's no avail. This went on all day. <laughs> and um, there was a meditation exercise of going and sitting by a river and tuning into the sound. And finally, that was enough to fully engage that extroverted sensing to really quiet it, that uh, my inner world could really arise and that introverted intuition. And finally, like the images started happening Um quick flashes at first when I was younger, right? But then I could intellectually work with those symbolic flashes. And then that just kept, that capacity kept growing and developing over the years. Um, and I used to say that the only thing I was uh, worse at than talking, uh, which I wasn't very articulate, as uh, some typologists have pointed out, that makes sense for an ESTP. Um, being able to put something into words uh, was years of translation. And so becoming a therapist was, I thought was a bit of a cosmic joke when I first got into the profession, because it just seemed like the thing that I would be least good at. Um, but I worked it out over a lot of individuation work. Again, just really working to study with masters in the field and doing training and being like, okay, so this is what I see. This is what I'm experiencing. Um, what are they calling it? And then pairing those two things. Um, and 
really starting to engage also with that sixth position of that extroverted thinking to like, this is that, like the categorization of this is what that is called, you know? Um, but sometimes it would be like someone would walk into the office and when I was in the beginning of the field, which I've been working with people now clinically for about 14 years, 15 years, something like that. And I'd be like, I don't know, they just seem gray. <laughs> But then as I would talk to my supervisors and my con doing consultation, I'd realize that gray meant depression or a lack of energy. And I started being able to kind of translate the extroverted sensing, extrovert, introverted thinking experience into, and even some of the introverted intuition into um, the, uh, the, the ways of, of categorization. And also as a clinician, really having to develop that extroverted thinking with being able to push back against that extroverted feeling when sometimes I'd want to say something makes someone feel better, but they needed to hear something else. Um, they needed to be taught something. Um, so being a clinician really forced a whole lot of um, some of the unconscious functions to really start activating and, and having to get developed. And um, that introverted feeling down in that trickster seventh, it was, is always been a bit rocky of knowing what do I really want? What do I really want? And I came up with a lot of different ways of getting into what I want, but it, I'm always the last to know how I feel. And um, uh, I know that it, I know my different, I have to like have whole processes to like access, like, what am I? feeling or what do I really want or what is my my value here um and I trust those processes to reveal that but it definitely took some time to develop that as a younger person um and uh that and what I said about getting into my dissertation eventually so we're going through the individuation arc here is the only thing that I was worse at than talking was writing um and um so when I got, I was working to figure out where I wanted to be, my niche to be in the clinical field. And most people were directing me towards issues. You specialize in issues, couples or anxiety, things to that effect. And I didn't want to specialize in an issue and specializing and only focusing on one issue just sounded like a nightmare probably for me as that ESTP. It's like, you know, don't box me in, right? And um, I was reading Marion Woodman's Conscious Feminine, and it just clicked that that's what I wanted to do. I wanted to focus on depth psychology and do what Marion Woodman did and uh, find my own version of that. And so I went off to get my PhD, but then it occurred to me I had to write a lot. <laughs> and so um, Kevin, Kevin Kell, my brother, he helped me a lot with some of the editing. And so when the first time we sat down to edit, he's like, okay, well, this is really good. You've got lots of specifics. Again, going back to that sensing, you know, with that lots of specifics, he's like, we need some summary sentences, just burst into tears. <laughs> and so, I mean, a lot of us have writing complexes, but I also learned that this is like bursting into tears was also about that demonic function with that extroverted intuition and him saying, well, all you have to do is use your eighth function. And I was like, it's hopeless. And in the same like kind of hopeless futility that I felt about having to like work with a dream image and work in that symbolic, I felt it, but I recognized it at this point. And there was a lot more of me having like individuated more functions online, you know, um, to kind of start to work with that. And uh, I learned that my process for getting a summary sentence was him to tell me, here's what you're writing about. You need some summary sentences me feeling like that was an impossible task, bursting into tears, ranting about how all of this was a web of connection around this thing, eventually the single point. And that's how I get to my summary sentence. It was very emotional. <laughs> it was super emotional. And then finally, um, I was able to start just going to summary sentences. Uh, it probably took about a year, year, year or two of coursework and writing like every every other day we had to do a post on monday post on repost on wednesday um uh reflection papers week nine two 15 page research papers uh, week 10 rinse repeat all year round you know so 
lots of just chronic using that. Um, and so um, the other art part of the article I got into was uh, me and my husband are both like very involved with lots of different things, but we had um, really recognized that we needed to develop more of our personal life and taking care of our, our home and all the small ways and keeping all those small details that were just building up. Um, and he started calling it my Hestia uh, complex. So the goddess of hearth and home. And um, so people who really enjoy cleaning and sweeping and caring for that home. Um, we had been through a mythology course that had talked about that being Hestia archetypally and um, also known as introverted sensing. And so, um, so I valiantly attempted to, again, how do I engage myself in these to actually make myself want to do it, not just because it has to be done. And I like ESTPs in general, I don't think we're very good at doing something because it, we're supposed to, right? Uh, so I was really working on that motivation. And so we was coming up to the holidays. So I decided to like fully decorate our house in kind of um, some of uh Kyle's heritage and some of my heritage. And so we have this banister and I went and got birch branches and put them all up everywhere. And uh, as Carol pointed out, so I first got extroverted sensing <laughs> as I was trying to get into the introverted intuition or introverted sensing. But then, um, and I wanted to have bows and, you know, go big or go home. And it might be another extroverted sensing component, right? And so I didn't just buy the bows. I like went and like got ribbon. And I was like, how hard could it be to tie a bow? You know? And I watched these YouTube videos and this is some things I talked about in the article and it's like, okay, I did a loop. Okay. Do another loop. All right. I can do this. I can do this. And then, and then I went to like tie it off and it just seemed so simple. And the whole thing just fell apart. <laughs> and it was, I, I write about this in the article. It was just this really funny Di inner dialogue that I was noticing. So uh, obviously I've developed a lot of the introspection and introversion um, to do the work I do, to do the self-reflection I do to help balance out some of the extroverted sensing. So I'm listening to this inner dialogue. And so I just go to do this loop again and, and it just starts becoming like everything that's ever been wrong in my life is because I can't make bows. And, <laughs> and, uh, and, and can I even take care of a home at all if I can't make bows? And this is so simple. Why can't I do this simple thing? And, and that's just the experience of getting into anything that's underdeveloped in us. And I recognized that and I knew that. So uh, I hung in there and it, it seemed like hours, but it must have probably been one. And there was a bow and uh, a rather like deformed, not very symmetrical <laughs> bow, but it was a bow. And every morning um, I'd get up and I'd make another bow until I had enough bows for my big project. And, um, and then I really did start to enjoy it. Like I actually really started to enjoy caring for the home and sweeping and get up in the morning and cleaning the kitchen. And it became very ritual-esque and really probably tapping into a lot of that introverted intuition as well in that fourth of meaning, right? Like, and so... I have found over the years, like really tapping into making something meaningful has been very helpful in developing that, um, the, whatever not dominant function I'm working on at that time. Uh, so I think that pretty much covers most of the article in, unless there's some other pieces that you wanted to pull out in particular. Um, and, um, I, I, one funny story was I did a, a typology assessment test and it said that was an ESFP. And like through working on this with lots of different people, I'm like, no, no, I'm definitely a, a T. And so I tried really, really hard because it was one that had like how much you are of each thing. And it, I was a little bit introverted thinking, right? And so I tried really, really hard on the next time around to like be thinking, right? And the introverted thinking went to zero and extroverted sensing went to like 100%. <laughs> And so I, that was really telling that when I was trying hard, um, I still just accentuated the dominant function instead of, you know, being able to further develop like that introverted thinking. So um, 
that always made me laugh about that too. Yeah, I find with online tests, females are more likely to score F and males are more likely to score T, even if their natural preference is the other way around. And so you mentioned how your brother was Kevin Kell, I believe, right? Mm -hmm. I've actually interviewed him. So if anyone wants to see that, I'll, I'll link it below as well. And so it's cool. There's that ENFP and ESTP dynamic between you two. And you're both therapists or counselors or something along the line mm -hmm. of that field. And so I'm wondering about how you guys interact with one another. What is the ENFP and ESTP dynamic like for you both? And was it a choice for you to both do that field together or did you decide on that separately? I'm, I'm curious. Yeah. So his type, his eight functions are directly opposite of mine. Um, so uh, we should probably not get along, but we're actually really close friends. And um, as far as getting into the field of social work or psychotherapy, um, yeah, that was made independently. That was not a collective decision. Um, and uh, he may have gone into how he chose that profession. Um, but I know for me, I really wanted to work to help people. Um, the the people nature split was really important to me to work to address in my career. And so uh, when I got into sustainable environmentalism, uh, I realized that it really mattered if people cared. So I figured I could do more good engaging on helping people be healthy enough and engaged enough in their life to care rather than doing environmental policy. So I came about it from that, that perspective. Um, also, I like working with people. So, and, but uh, when we were younger, he definitely annoyed me. Um, <laughs> but um, we, even then we were, we were, we were close, but we really became much closer when he got, became a teenager. Uh, we're about, we're six years apart. So that also is part of the dynamic. Um, but uh, we engage really well now. He actually, he works with us um, at the clinic. So whenever I need something sent out, um, I'll go to him and I'll be like, okay, so here's all these like detailed sensing things about the project or about something. Can you, what, what am I doing? Right? Like, what is that summary extroverted intuition say that it, what we're doing? And uh, that's really cool. And um he also really will bring me ideas and I'll be like, okay, we can apply it this way and this way and this way. And so again, that direct application. Uh, so we really actually complement each other very well. And uh, um, when the pandemic hit, uh, so my husband, an, um, INTJ, it was really fascinating. So the three of us all worked together um, and um when um, about a year or so before the pandemic hit, Kyle had come to me and said, you know, I think we should really like make sure we have a good section of our emergency supplies and there should be masks. Like out of nowhere. Now his best guess was it would be like gas masks. Like, you know, like why would you, or like ventilation mask or something. He's like, I don't know why masks. And that was that predictive introverted intuition just coming out of nowhere. And um, I had been out at Pacifica for our class in February 2020. And as I stepped onto campus, I got an intuitive hit from that inferior function that said, uh, this will be the last time you're on campus. And I was like, what? I've got three more visits this year. You know, like, what do you mean this last time I'll be on campus? Well, within a month, we were in shutdown, right? Well, Kevin, with that extroverted intuition dominant, he... Um, um, probably about two to three months prior to the, the pandemic, we were a hundred percent, uh, in person. And he started coming to Kyle and I and saying, uh, we need, um, to come up with a policy and, uh, a flyer to, or like a, a memo to hand out to our clients about how telehealth is going to work. And we're like, really? Do we really need this? And he's like, no, no, I'll do it because he's the director of information. So we're like, okay, it's your it's your role, your job. Okay, go ahead. And um, March hit and there's all this talk of pandemic. Some places were going under quarantine. And um, Kyle and Kevin and I got on a phone call one morning and we knew this was the morning we were like, we were talking about when do we switch to telehealth? 
And um, as I'm walking up to get on the call, I'm just like, I don't know why we're having this call. It's happening today. Right. And so, um, you know, sure enough, that's what we decided we were doing. And uh, so I'm like, OK, so send out, you know, the uh, send out the flyer. We're switching to telehealth. Here's how we're going to do it. You know, Kyle and Kevin. So and we switch. So in the beginning of the pandemic, it was so fascinating to watch because Kyle's predictive function would happen like long, long uh, in that long sight. Right. And then Kevin, he would just absorb all of the news and the media and the research. And he had a really solid predictive function about two to three months out. Like, where we're going to get off quarantine, um, what we're kind of what kind of like uh, restrictions we need, like masks or distance. And, you know, and so um, we ended up really working as a really good team and ended up changing. And then our, our way we function as a company, like three major times. So we went from all person, uh, all telehealth, and then a hybrid model that was constantly responding to the needs of whatever was going on in, in the world. So um, I was not only not only do I enjoy Kevin, he, you know, very grateful for his capacities as an ENFP. And um, um, so, yeah, it's a really fun dynamic with all of that. And we've, we've learned over the years how to communicate certain things. Like there's certain miscommunications, but um, it, it's like one of those things when it goes well, it's going really well. But when we get off kilter, like <laughs> we, we can get into what, uh, has been termed a uh, violent agreement. <laughs> we're both talking about the same thing, but we're adamant about what we're saying. And anyone listens, it's like listens to us. will say like, you're, you're talking about the same thing. <laughs> and um, that's been really funny over the years is, is uh, that kind of conflict. But, but we, we work it out and um, we end up making something much better because of it. Yeah. I'm going to take away that term violent agreement. You guys think that you might be talking about different things, but it's really the same thing, but it's, yeah, interesting. <laughs> so Kyle, is he the INTJ husband, just to make sure? Okay. Kyle and I did a presentation for the San Francisco Bay Typology Group um, uh, last February for um, about couples. And we did a whole presentation about working with um, typology both our typology as an example with couples and then taking a look at it in general. Um, Kevin was actually one to point out that Kyle and I will get into arguments uh, that are TI and TE arguments. And so whenever Kyle and I are trying to like parent or care for a situation, we go into that second function. And like Jung says that where TI and TE get together, there's always war. <laughs> and so Kevin has had a lot of fun pointing that out. And again, that's that extroverted sensing what's happening that I, I really enjoy uh, hearing about. But um, it's just so funny. And he's like, oh, oh, you're saying TI. Oh, oh, that's a TE response. Oh, he doesn't understand you because you're using TI. <laughs> so um, say it again, say it again. You're just being that trickster, you know, and um, it, that's a, another typology uh, relationship component that I've seen. Yeah, when TE and TI together, there's war. And I wonder if it's the same thing with FE and FI as well. <laughs> the differences in the judging functions. I guess when you have TE, you always have FI. And when you have TI, you always have FE. So in a sense, they're always it's like the axis is fighting against each other. I was actually thinking what I've also seen with the F5 FE people, because I've led a couple of typology groups, like where groups of people gotten together and they all know their functions and all learning about it with each other. Is that like, especially with the feeling functions being different, it's like that they feel each other is basically almost doing something immoral, right? <laughs> like what, what you have to take the group into consideration. What? What? No, you have to find that internal, you know, harmony with like what is, um, you know, universally true. Like, no, you know, so, and I'm like, it's OK. It's going to be OK. <laughs> That's beautiful. You just summed up the fights perfectly. And so, Vanessa, I'm wondering, how does a TI versus TE war look like between you and your husband and just TI and TE wars in general? <laughs> um. Well, they're not wars. We, we keep it civil. Okay. <laughs> um, so I, I would say uh, disagreements. Um, 
part of the problem is they they the way they look if you're not bringing in a different function and understanding what you're dealing with is they diverge more and more because you get more and more adamant from that function um so kyle will say something categorical you know um you know this is how this works and then that's that te right and then i'll come in and i'll say but it depends <laughs> with that ti and it's like well it depends and um he's like no <laughs> And I'm like, well, yeah, I understand what you're saying, but look at the versatility of the situation. And he goes, if you're showing me versatility, you don't understand me. <laughs> and um, so that is some of what we have to both kind of like walk out of, right? Or really trust each other with is like, because he can get into the, it depends, you know, he's just not saying it right now. And I can get into the specifics and, and category, but like, I think he's leaving that out, you know? Um, I think also some of it is that um, extroverted thinking, much like many of the extroverted functions have are given preferential treatment in the culture. And so um, a lot of the introverted functions like introverted feeling or introverted like intuition, but introverted thinking, you know, my second is like where I go, like, but we care about introverted thinking <laughs> and like want to like kind of adamantly like defend its value. Right. But that when I'm doing that with Kyle, it, he already values it. It's just, we're talking about something else at that moment. And so I have to remind myself that he does value that. Um, we're just talking about something else right now. And, uh, not necessarily argue that point at that moment. And so we start to, where we work our way out of it is doing, here's what I hear you saying. And do I have that, do I have it right kind of idea? And I have found, especially with introverts, that's really important for extroverts to mirror back to them what they're hearing before we like jump on to the next idea that we're excited to share. Because of course, what you said is interesting and I heard it. Otherwise, why what I what I would be responding to, and um, but that's not a given for for introverts, um, especially introverted intuition types. So um, working to reflect back has been helpful. The other um, conflict with the the TI and TE, um, it's not a, it's not a conflict, but I will be super excited about theorizing. So I have, you know, with my dissertation or with Dr. Clifford Mays, I'll like be working on these like highly abstract theoretical concepts about how the psyche can work and archetypes and like throughout history, which has a lot to do with what my dissertation is, is the evolution of the psyche, you know, throughout time. And I'll be like, Kyle, Kyle, I have this theory. And he's like, ah, because <laughs> even just the energy of it, where I go, just sends him straight in um, to his sixth position. Yes, in the sixth position. And so he he can hear it, but he's got to kind of be really ready to like really listen. And because if he's really following, especially with that introvert intuition where he's following, it just pulls him into a spot that doesn't work real well, like, and he doesn't like it, you know? <laughs> so understanding that uh, I can't just like bombard him with TI, right? Um, that, that is, um, helpful for me to remember. And so I'm like, Hey, I have a cool new theory. Are you in the space to hear it? You know, and really being in that ongoing dialogue. So, um, those are some of how that, uh, divergent component happens that I notice with TI and TE. Yeah. The, the TI user or the TP is like, it's contextual, this thing, it depends. And then the TE user or the TJ is like, doesn't depend. It is this or that. <laughs> <laughs> and I could see that. I could see that butting heads and very complimentary too, in the sense that it helps you grow. So anyone who is very radically different than you is a mirror to your blind spots or your subconscious or your shadow. So I think that's really awesome. You seem to have a very playful relationship with your brother and your husband too, in a sense where you all can speak typology together. I think that's every type lover's dream to be in a space where the people around you like type as well. So you have that covered. 
And so before we close out this interview, Vanessa, I'm wondering about your experience with each of your top four functions. And so that's S-E-T-I-F-E-N-I. And so I'm wondering about your personal experiences with that. I know you sprinkled it throughout the interview. I'm wondering about any concise ways you tend to put it that resonate the most for you. Just so I'm clear, you're asking like specific examples of how I experience each of those? Yeah, I'm asking that. And also, what would you boil it down to? Like, what are they? Yeah, yeah. in essence, your unique definition of it. It depends. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> um, yeah. Hang on. I can get specific, but ESTPs, we have a hard time being specific. We'll tell you stories all day long, right? Um, extroverted sensing. We'll start with dominant function. Um, I would say the essence of extroverted sensing is a certain amount of of i don't want to say this is the essence all the time of the function but one of the ways i really understand it is the joy of colors and the senses and being in beautiful places and there's just a call and an energizing component of that and being able to engage and move with those spaces um is a is a, a big component of that and just the enjoyment of um and the energy that comes from being in the physicality of of things like uh even if i'm just trying out a martial arts like um in a demonstration i'll have intuitive hits which i know is my introverted intuition acting but but just like liking the physical experience of trying new positions of yoga or uh in dance you know, um, and equally so with extroverted sensing it, um, the idea like the don't fence me in component, right. Is that in that built in commitment phobia <laughs> is that if I can't get to a new vibrant place, how am I going to keep that vibrancy? And so there's a fear of that being lost or taken away or things becoming dull. Right. It's like, well, where will I get my energy? So I guess in essence, the extroverted sensing is really getting energy and engagement with uh, the physical material world and senses. Um, introverted thinking. The way I have to find it for other people is, um, you know, the, the gauging of can I get to first base, second base, can I steal second base before they throw me out? You know, the, the, um, can I move here? Like when I'm rock climbing, can I make this leap, you know, and get there, you know, without falling? Um, but also then that theorizing. So, um, so it's, it's that gauging and that abstract theorizing of, of, um, just kind of also, again, that care and love of, um, being able to figure things out and the excitement, and I guess love's not quite word, but the energizing component of um, putting things together, you know, and not caring at all about their like practicality. <laughs> um, it's like, oh, look what I can do or look what I figured out, right? But it it's not about the um, practicality. It's like, well, how, how is it practical? Eh. So I'm like, oh, it'll eventually be practical. So I'd say in essence, the introverted thinking I would say is the gaining energy from um, that engagement of figuring out and abstractions that you're bringing together uh, through through mind and its own type of uh, logic. It isn't very categorical and very flexible. I'd say the extroverted feeling. Um, really paying attention and seeing the value of um, bringing together groups of people, understanding um, the value of what matters to people, and then really finding, uh, again, that value of, of helping that group work in a harmonious way. I did a Teams course and 
high ropes courses and had a new group of people every day and just finding the way to get them to experience what it's like to work as a good group really like fueled that for like five or six years. I did that. I really enjoyed that. Right. So I'd say extrovert feeling, um, well, I guess I would boil it down to the the valuing of recognizing the group's values and bringing them together in that harmony um, that that matters, right? And recognizing that mattering, um, which I think our world can use a lot more of. But the problem is, is so much of that gets co-opted by codependency and then it becomes people pleasing instead of really working to find value and even the difficult conversations that might cause conflict, but ultimately create a, a better harmony. An introverted intuition. Um, yeah, just the, the, the coming out of nowhere insights, uh, really finding meaning, um, the, the symbolic nature of the psyche, um, that I would say would I'd boil that down to is that knowing without knowing that gives a psychological contextual component of what's taking place and um, really understanding how the world invisible, whether it be feeling, psyche, spirituality actually matters. Really well summed up, Vanessa. It's really beautiful, the engagement aspect of extroverted sensing and how it's looking for vibrancy of experience and engagement. So, wow, that's beautiful. Thank you for coming out. I appreciate your nuanced take on type and how you really delineate the ESTP experience with a lot of grace and you show the exciteful life of an ESTP and the inner psychological experience. And so you're really good at illustrating your own mind, especially after having individuated by incorporating more of your introverted intuition into your psyche. And so, yeah, I'm, I'm really glad to have someone as dedicated to type and all the pursuits that you do in your life here today. Your articles really help some of my subscribers because I actually mm -hmm. heard about you because someone sent me an email about your article. So it must mean that your article changed them in some way. So yeah, mm -hmm. you're really making a difference. Kyle had actually suggested that someday when I'm finished with my PhD to do a ESTP guide to writing a dissertation. So. <laughs> that would be beautiful. Yeah, the, a lot of ESTPs would feel in solidarity with you. Yeah. <laughs> And in fact, a lot of ESTPs are joining the type community now in the, in the newer generations because I think practical application is being highlighted in some schools of thought right now. So yeah, I think that's exciting. And then they'll come across you and then they'll be inspired because they're like, yeah, and another ESTP was here, so I can do it too. Yeah, we found that it's really important. Kyle, Kevin, and I all do typology assessments and teaching people because like engagement with understanding themselves and relationships and professions have been super practically orientedly helpful. Awesome. All right. And so thank you, Vanessa, for coming out. Thank you, everyone, for watching. I really appreciate this deep dive into the ESTP psyche. I'll see you all in the next episode. Bye. Thank you. Mm -hmm.